Welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. I'm Joshua Stike along here with Luke Acre. Today, we have a really cool uh, guest. We're kind of talking about this when we introed him in, but this is really neat because he is the co-CEO of a company called Big B Coffee yeah, that's blowing incredible. up in the Midwest. Huge. I think he had, we thought it was a $100 million company. He says it's like a yeah. $450 million in sales. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this he is said exciting. his goal is like a billion. Right. And then by 2028, I mean, some of the golden nuggets in here are incredible because he has franchisees he's dealing with. He has, you know, 250 plus locations. So, so many good things on leadership, on sales. It's going to be incredible. Well, as a matter of fact, this is kind of a little bit of a teaser. That $1 billion in sales goal is actually coupled along with his company's vision statement. And it was really, really interesting to hear how he talked about yep. not only their vision is one thing, and you'll hear about that in the interview, but this idea of reaching a billion dollars in sales is so that everyone else will care mm. about their vision. Yeah, so, so I good. That, that was really cool. We're going to introduce him in just a second. In the meantime, this week's featured review comes from Horses and Puppies. So all of the horses <laughs> and all of the puppies got together and left State Paid a review yeah. on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> we appreciate you. The title of the review is Pete at Medicare Help NY. So I, I think okay. this is actually from Pete. Uh, but it's five stars, says, great show, always interesting, with a couple of nuggets every show. I'm in the insurance space, and I'm never disappointed by the show guests or topic. I'm glad to be part of your audience. And he spelled audience, O-D-D-I-E-N-C-S, or a C-E. So like, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't a typo. And if it wasn't, and he is spelling his audience, like that makes me so happy that the listeners of our show consider themselves an ODD audience. <laughs> an odd. It fits in. <laughs> if you uh, could take a minute to help out the That's show, so we would great. love for you to review us on Apple Podcasts as well. You can leave a review and a comment along there to let us know how we're doing. And now let's get into this week's interview. From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Stake, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, guys. Great to be here. Michael, it's awesome to have you on the show. Hey, take a, just a few minutes. I would love for you to share your journey, right? You've built this massive organization. You're in an industry where a lot of our listeners probably, they don't have any familiarity. What does it take to build a brand, like a coffee brand and something like that? So I'd love to hear your journey, how you built the company, and then we can get into this topic because I know you've written a book called Grind. And so would love to get into that topic next, but share a little bit about your journey. Yeah, we're 25 years old. Uh, we we just turned 25 uh, March 15th. Today. You know, right right as we smashed face to first into COVID, we were going to celebrate our 25th anniversary. But we've been at it 25 years. I uh, I started as a, a, a minimum wage barista in our first store, and mm. so that was uh, my entree into the business. I ended up uh, partnering uh, with Bob Fish. Uh, he he built the first store. He owned the first store. Uh, he and I ended up uh, partnering uh, to develop the brand. Uh, we uh, we did all of that on a handshake. So it's it's become a little bit of it's become infamous in our world. It's called the walk. And and what happened was is he uh, sat down to interview me for an assistant manager's job, right? And uh, and and I uh, we ended up going for a four and a half hour walk around East Lansing. This would have been uh, March of. of of 1996, uh, 1997, something like that, and and uh, by the end of that walk, we shook hands and agreed to be business partners. Wow! And and uh, and so you know we did form a company, uh, and that company is the company that we've been building now uh, since we, we formed that company in June of 1998. And and you know the the whole the whole mo every single day uh, since the day we shook hands and agreed to be partners, we've been focused on selling one more cup of coffee tomorrow than we did today. Mm. And and when I started in the business, when I became assistant, because I, I did move into an assistant manager's <laughs> role after that walk uh, and at the first store, and we were selling under 300 cups of coffee a day at that point. And uh, I remember the first time we crossed 300, I called them at close, you know, like midnight. And I was all excited. We sold 300 <laughs> cups of coffee awesome, that man. day. It was like a big threshold. And and today we're selling, and, you know, north of 70,000 cups a day. Uh, and wow. So, How know, many locations? Uh, How many locations you guys have? 
We have 248 locations open, but the really exciting number uh, is we have 114 under contract to be open. So wow. we're, we're, a, we're a franchise model. Okay. So all the stores are independently owned, locally owned. And, uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll do, uh, I think we're forecra- forecasting at about 165 million this year in, 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 in gross sales. That is <sighs> unbelievable. You guys just focus on coffee or you um, spread out from there? That's pretty. It's coffee. I mean, that's okay. our core product. And and yep. you know, people will ask me for one word uh, to answer the question as to how we uh, were able to grow the business to where we've gotten it to today. And the answer to that question is focus. Mm. We're beverage retailers. We wake up in the morning. We try to sell one more cup cup of coffee uh, today than we did yesterday, and that's that's what we've done for twenty five years. And you know, it's one of the things that I think gets a lot of entrepreneurs in trouble is is they're always looking for that answer that that like well, what can we bolt on here to make uh, to, to to generate more revenue? Well, bolting things on makes things more complex, right? Mm. So what we do is we sell cups of coffee. Mm. You're speaking to our our soul right now. Yeah, you, seriously, <laughs> I mean, I literally just did an Instagram post yesterday about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett the first time they met, or this story. I don't know if it's actually true, but I think it is. And they were asked the question, "What's the key to your success?" And without talking to each other, they both wrote down one word on a piece of paper, and that word was focus. And, and so, yeah, that's Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. I've never yeah, heard look that it up. Story. Yeah. So, I mean, well, it's on my Instagram now, but you can Google it. It also comes up there. <laughs> but I mean, it's so true, man. It, like people are always chasing the magic formula and they don't realize if you just double down. I'm curious before we jump into the book, because my curiosity is just taking over. How do you stand out in such a crowded industry? Because I think this could be super applicable. Because a lot of our listeners are like in the real estate industry, the financial services industry, that type of thing. You're up against behemoths like Starbucks, like Dunkin' Donuts, all these. And then you have the mom and pop coffee shops. I mean, how do you stand out? What's your vision from a differentiation standpoint for your brand? Well, we, I mean, there's like an hour long answer to that question, which <laughs> I we have, probably can't get into, right? But, but, you know, I think the simple answer to that question is, is we, we found, a sweet spot in our branding. And that is, you know, we are, we, 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 we position ourselves right in between the large players, right? So you have, you have Starbucks on one end, you got McDonald's on the other, you know, McDonald's is, is, uh, you know, from a coffee perspective anyway, is, is very much a, a middle America brand. Starbucks is a very pretentious brand. We sit right in the middle, feed off of both sides, right? Mm. That's been our strategy. We've been doing it for 25 years. Anybody that we want, anybody that's going to walk into our store to feel comfortable. And, you know, the other thing that I would say is, is most people don't understand the, how repetitive you have to be in your messaging in order for it to get through. And, you know, so we've been saying the same things over and over and over and over. And, you know, as the operator, you you start to, it's like, oh my, it starts getting boring, you know, but that is what works. That's what's effective. And so if you, if you're constantly changing your messages, if you're constantly changing what you're saying to people, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. No, that's so, true. And, and, and think of like how many messages hit you on a daily basis. Yep. And then if you throw in the variable of changing up that message, all of a sudden, there's no message from, from one brand. So staying on point, continuing to send the same message over and over and over again, eventually it resonates. That's such Event- a golden nugget, man. It takes so much self-discipline to say no. I mean, we were literally looking at them because we're looking at coaching for an aspect of our business. We do marketing. So we're looking at trying to expand and going to start a coaching avenue where we can coach our clients. And we were even talking about like, you know, because we were turning some people down that want to partner with us. And it's hard to turn opportunity down. But the reason why we were looking to turn opportunity down is because we're like, it doesn't really fit with our core competency. Like it really doesn't fit with our brand. And that's so hard to do. And it takes so much discipline and self-control. So I think that's an amazing point that you made. Yeah, it reminds me of the hedgehog concept from good to great, you know, really focusing yeah. on that one single thing. So yeah. maybe kind of uh, going off of that and, and looking at the idea of focus, you know, you wrote this book called Grind, the no BS approach to take your business from concept to cash flow obviously requires a ton of focus. What led you to require or to write that book and kind of go over what people might get from it? Well, I spent a lot of time. I, I'm, I love to read. I just, I read, you know, more than I should. Uh, and, and, you know, I've never found many of the books on entrepreneurship authentic. 
you know, they're, they're either written, they're, I, I classify them into two groups. One, there is the, you know, the, the nine figure net worth flying around on a private jet, looking back on business startup through rose colored glasses from 30,000 feet. And they're fun to read. Don't get me wrong. I love reading those, but there's, there's not a lot there from a, you know, to lessons learned. Um, and oftentimes those books are, you know, a big ego stroke for, for the person writing them, you know, and I, I, you know, again, fun to read, but not that, not that uh, useful. Yeah. The other, the other genre of book is academic studying entrepreneurs. And, and there's a place for that too, but that always falls short for me too, because in academia, you got to prove everything out, mm. right? By the time you prove everything out, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gone. It's moved on to the next argument, one. You know? yeah, but, right. So, so, but I, you know, I, I don't mean to be derogatory towards either one of those groups, but I've, I, I wanted to write a book that really tried to capture the essence of, of what entrepreneurship feels like, what it, what it might be like to become an entrepreneur. And, and, you know, that was, that was the goal of the book completely. That's awesome. Is that kind of where this idea of the CEO disease kind of came in was from the book or is that something that you developed later or? So that's a little bit of a different, different land. That's, that's more in, in the leadership. Uh, this book is not, my book on grind is not on leadership. It, you know, the CEO disease to me is, you know, the, the biggest fault, the biggest uh, issue I think in leadership is people lack awareness. And, and, you know, the, the, the CEO disease is you got a bunch of people around you that tell you you're great every single day. <clears throat> <laughs> Every single day, and 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 it is the rare person in an organization that's willing to stand up to the CEO and say, "Dude, you're you know, mm. you're off the mark here." And and, uh, and so one of the benefits that I have uh, is that I have a business partner. Uh, you know, we're equal partners, fifty fifty, and so we get to point out to each other all the times that we, you know, we fall short or we, you know, act inappropriately. But you know, to me, the CEO disease is one of complete and total self importance. Mm. And, 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 you know, when I sit in rooms and I listen to, to, to leaders talk or, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I, I won't mention any names, but the, the, the issue is they, they take oftentimes 85% of the energy in the room mm. and everybody's waiting on the CEO, on the leader and, and trying to read the leader and which direction is the leader going as opposed to having an authentic conversation where you're bringing your real thoughts to the table and you're really hammering away at, at solutions and so on. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm just really kind of early on in my work around leadership uh, and, and, uh, and this, this thing that <laughs> somehow got coined the CEO to see, I'm not sure where I said that <laughs> and that got caught and it's, it's like kind of got a little it's bit of a life on. of its own now. Yeah. And I, 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 but I, you know, um, but how do you? Chapter, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, but how do you create that in the boardroom, in the in the leadership, like from a culture standpoint? How have you done that at your organization to to create an environment where people can speak their mind? Well, I'm not I'm not sure we're we're 100 successful on that yet. Sure. Um, you know, my partner, I still carry a whole bunch of of weight. Uh, but but really, I think the answer to that question, the simple answer to that question, is is the leader's got to shut up. Mm. Just have this really crazy awkward silence. You know, and the, and there's uh, there's all this study around you know introverts and and extroverts and and how that works in the dynamic of a team. You know, and the amazing thing is is if you let that awkward silence happen, it's it's oftentimes when the the introvert will step in. And that introvert has thought through what they're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's generally pretty darn good. Right. And, and the I problem agree is, with that. is they, they don't get that opportunity, yep. right? Because the extroverts are rolling and the, and the CEOs like, you know, holding cord. And, and so the introvert sits back, but, but if you can let enough silence happen and, and, and hopefully enough safety happen where that, that introvert can bring the argument, all of a sudden it's like, holy smokes, we didn't even think of that. Yeah, you know that that happens all the time. It's interesting the struggle, and it, I don't I'm not sure if you feel this. Like within the company, it's if I just think of our company, I think the real struggle a lot is you want to create the place of trust where people feel they can speak their mind, but you also want to have a culture of accountability, and that balance of you're going to be held accountable for your results, hold a, held accountable for your ideas, right? And what you do, because it is a performance-based, you know, it's what we do. 
But at the same time, we want you to speak your mind. So that I think is, I don't know if you find in your organization, that has always like been the tension, I think, for us in our organization is like, it's hard to build a place of trust if everything you do is you're held accountable for, but you don't want to have a, a system that's not an accountability system. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know if, if you've done much reading on Deming, but um, the quality guy from like the 50s. I, I haven't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he's, he, he is, a, I mean, he's, he's uh, pretty powerful, but he talks a lot about how performance-based issues get in the way of, of authenticity in an organization, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a really deep analysis. And, and I, I agree with you on the, that's, that's a struggle. Right, I think you you really hit the hit a hit a, a, a salient point with that's the struggle. Like if if you're if you're performance based and that's maybe all that matters ish, well, that's what you're going to be focused on. You may not be focused on bringing the authentic thought to the leadership table, or maybe the authentic thought gets it could get in the way of the performance. The performance, stuff. yep. Yeah. I, Look, is any is anybody ever going to bring a thought that would lower their performance, even though it might be better for the organization as a whole? Probably not. Right. Yeah. And I think it's like, um, this is where what I've learned over the years, and, and like you, man, very, very new, or I haven't even developed fully my thoughts on leadership. But what I've learned is like, that's why the vision is so important. Like it should be the vision that almost is the disciplinarian, the vision that is the rewarder. Like, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but when you move it outside yourself and you go, it's the vision that really ends up telling you, have you done a good job or not? Have you succeeded or not? Reward you because you're fulfilling that vision. Then it's not about what Luke thinks about you. It's not about what Josh thinks about you. It's what the vision has said about you. And I think that's why visions are so important for organizations. They're not just corny things you write down and you put up on your walls. You actually have to live and breathe it because it's going to be the instrument and in which holds you accountable and which rewards you. Yeah. I, so we've had a... a catharsis in our organization over the last five years in relation to purpose and vision. And, and any, any leader that isn't, isn't fully engaged in figuring that piece of their world out, um, is, is, is going to, is going to miss, miss, miss the boat. Right. Mm -hmm. And we took two years, it took us two years to hit, to get to our vision. It was crazy. And it, and it was, a uh, yeah, that's a whole huge story in and of itself, but it has been the driving force for us for the, I mean, we have made so much change since committing to that vision. It's been, is this a public almost, vision? What, what is the vision of Big B Coffee? The vision of Big B Coffee is to improve workplace culture in the United States. Wow. Whew. That's a that, big vision. That's a, a big, hairy, audacious goal referencing the good to great. <laughs> what led to that? Great, keep continuing the good to great <laughs> yeah, references. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, yeah. Uh, and so there's two sides of that coin, though. And, and, you know, the vision has to have metrics associated with it or you don't know whether you've hit it or not. And so the, the, two, the two metrics that we've agreed to are one, um, 90% of our employees who've been with us a year or longer will state that Big B Coffee will rate us either a nine or a 10 uh, in relation to the question of whether Big B Coffee is supporting you in building a life that you love. Hmm. The other metric is we'll be a billion dollar company at retail. And so though, that's by 2028. And the, the reason, so the, 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 the purpose side of the vision, right? Which is the people side of our vision is so that we are living out this workplace culture initiative, right? the billion dollars is just so people care. <laughs> yeah. you know, we can, we can be a, a tiny little regional chain <laughs> of coffee so shops great. And, and, and like have this amazing purpose and everybody's saying that we're supporting the billion life they love, but everybody's like, yeah, who cares? But if we can, if we can do that at the same time that we're building a billion dollar brand, then people will care. And then we'll get to talk about it. Mm. And that's the whole idea. Yeah, that's so, that's so good, man. All right, so talk about this no BS right? That you're writing this book, The Grind. And you mentioned something that really resonates with Josh and I, that basically sales is everything. In fact, on our wall, if anybody wonders like, hey, what do you guys have up on your wall at Reminder Media? We actually have a huge quote when you walk in the door that says sales isn't everything, it's the only thing. (laughs) So so you can tell we care about the sale, right? We see sales as an essential driving force to any organization. Give us your take on what is this no BS um, that you write about within The Grind book and walk through how do you get a business from concept to cash flow? 
So there's a there's a book, um, Amar Bide, B H I D E. Uh, he's at Harvard. I, when he wrote the book, I think he's at Tufts now. But he he studied the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So he took all the data on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies over 20 years. And and there's a bunch of really great nuggets he pulled out of that. But the one that I that resonated with me and I, you know, I, when I read it, I couldn't believe it. 85% of the CEOs on that list, 85% claim they were either the only or primary salesperson in the organization at startup. Wow. Wow. So if you don't, if you want to grow your business, you, the entrepreneur, you have to be a sales. I, I was the primary salesperson in our organization for 15 years. That was all I did. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there, you know, I was proud of it. I mean, that I was going to grow this business. That was what I was going to do. If you don't have that mentality, you're, I mean, so sales to me is business, period. Mm. The smartest people in the organization, in my opinion, is the sales team. Why? Because they're interacting with the customer and they're figuring out why the customer is buying or why the customer isn't buying. Yeah. And that's all that matters. You can have all kinds of product people, right? Yep. Trying to develop a better and new product. If they aren't getting the information from the sales team on how to improve the product, it's just a huge miss. And, and it is remarkable. I, I teach a class at University of Michigan on entrepreneurship, right? This sort of an entry level entrepreneurship class. And one of the messages, it, that we say, I, I co-teach with another guy is, you know, finding the customer is absolutely quintessential to the startup. Mm. And finding the customer simply means selling to the customer, right? Like, and so it is, to me, it is, it is so important for everyone who wants to start a business. You know, the, the title of my book was going to be sell more shit. Period. <laughs> if you want to be an entrepreneur, s- sell more shit. Like that's it. And and the the, the publisher would That'll, be the, that. <laughs> That'll be the second edition. That'll be the second edition. <laughs> yeah, volume two. I'll sell, I'll so, sell a lot more books with that title. Yeah, uh, M- M- Michael, how do you facilitate that? Like, like operationally, like how do you facilitate? You mentioned the the sales getting the information back to the product team, and obviously you've got a very strong product, and you have a lot of people out there, two hundred fifty locations selling this product. How are you? How do you facilitate that in a way that scales? I guess would be the question. Yeah, a million dollar question, right? That's the, I mean, that's the million dollar question, and and you know the the thing is is people have this notion of what a salesperson is. Hmm. That they're, you know, they're some kind of slick glad hander, good looking, <laughs> you know, quick wit. Well, I don't uh, know. Luke, you know. Luke is a sales guy. I don't know. <laughs> good looking. <laughs> Absolutely. He's a sales guy. <laughs> well, so, but you know, nothing's further from the truth, frankly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to me, you just got to build a mechanism. And, and it's about refining that mechanism. And that mechanism is, is you, you, you feed leads into the top of that mechanism. The mechanism flow, you know, takes that lead and kicks out deals. And, and so your job as the entrepreneur is to perfect the mechanism and then spend your whole life trying to feed the top of that funnel leads. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so, you know, to me, that, that's not typically how people think about sales. Right, they think about sales as, as some kind of a, a magical thing that an individual has to be a good salesperson. Okay, and 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 I don't I don't think I don't that doesn't resonate with me at all. What resonates with me is is you build a machine, you build a mechanism that handles leads and flows leads through a process, and then you you tweak, you change, and then you watch the results. Right, mm-hmm. and 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 the results are what matter. That's so good. And there's such a golden nugget there for people is like most of us, when we do sales, we think of it like we're just talking to somebody and convincing them to buy our product. And it's all about the pitch, right? And those type of things. Not saying the pitch is not important, but what you're breaking down is if you want to grow a massive organization, if you just want to grow an organization that lasts five, 10 years, you need a scalable and repeatable process. Like you need to know if it, the pitch is important, it's because you've developed in your pitch, your funnel, your process within that pitch to get someone to purchase and you can do it over and over again and it works 20% of the time type idea. So like that scalable, And then you make repeatable. a change and you get it to work 20.38% of yes. the time. 
And then you make another change and you get it to work 20.74% of the time, yeah. right? Oh, because that, especially that, in organizations like your size too, one little point of a percentage can make a huge difference. For us, it was 1%. We had lost, what, a million dollars? Million. Six million dollars. Yeah. If we could have changed it by a, a percentage point, just our conversion on, I think it was paid leads. Uh, leads overall, but it was over the course of three years. Yeah, yeah six, $6 million. million we lost so out painful, on. It was a painful stat to run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. It was, it Let's made, just say we're focusing more on conversions yeah. <laughs> today than two weeks ago. It was, it was, it was very, very painful. Yeah. So meaning like, it's like all comes down to that re- repeatable process that then you can take to scale. Mm. Um, and you look at these, like you mentioned McDonald's, right? I mean, look at their processes. Like they are process machines. I think of like, you know what I respect the most about like a Chick-fil-A? I'd love to get your take on this. Chick-fil-A is so freaking processed out, right? You can just tell, like, the, the, like go through a Chick-fil-A Everyone drive Everyone knows where through. they're going. Everyone moves with purpose. Yeah, like yeah. there's a purpose. But their people, or at least the interactions that I have in the Chick-fil-A's I run into, their people are proud yeah. of working for Chick-fil-A. And, and I'm not looking down on fast food or anything like that, but it's fast food. And they're right. proud of working there. So much so they're proud that they say, my pleasure, instead of you're welcome. Like they've mm-hmm. got, and I think to myself, man, how do I process out even reminder media so people don't feel like they're in like a robot? <laughs> they're proud of what they're doing. I don't know if you figured that out. Like how do you get your people to do that process without taking the life out of them? Well, process is what allow, frees you up and allows you to be creative. So if you don't have to think about what you're supposed to do next, if it's just routinized over and over and over, then that frees you up to actually be creative or to actually engage in a conversation with the customer, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the process in our stores, I mean, we, we built a whole company on process. That, that, that we are, our number one core value is we're a systems-driven organization. And, mm-hmm. and, and we have a process for, for, for just about everything. And if we don't have a process for it, somebody needs to tell us because we got to figure one out, right? So, so um, and, and to me, uh, people want to be successful. This is, this is what it kills me in the world when I hear business managers complain about their people. People want to be successful. What they need to know is you need to define what they're supposed to do Mm -hmm. and when, prioritize their time, and then you need to explain to them how to act. Give them the attitude that you want from them. They will do it, Mm -hmm. right? Because they want to be successful. When when I hear people complain about about their people, I immediately go to, you're a bad manager. Mm. If you're complaining about your people, you are a bad manager. That's a golden so, nugget. Great. So, so prioritize their time and then, and then give them the expectation on how you want them to act. They will do it. And, and, it, and it's remarkable to me uh, how, how effective that's been for us. Our number one compliment, the number one thing we hear in the world is how amazing our people are. Mm. That's not an accident. We don't, you know, the other thing you'll hear is, is it's so hard to find good people. You don't find good people. People are good in general. What you do is you create an environment that people can thrive within, wow. period. And so, you know, that's what Chick-fil-A is doing, is they're providing this amazing environment for people to show up to that allows those people to be successful in their job. Mm. Dude, Love that's that. so good. It reminds me of Jocko. We had Jocko, the extreme ownership guy, uh, speak to our company. And he talked about how they have a process for even parking the Humvees <laughs> in the Navy SEALs. And he, and he, and he explained it as the in like... The angle of the wheels have the to be angle, turned. everything. Yeah. And he basically said, you would think, oh, that's insulting. People should know how to easily park a Humvee. He goes, no, because every little detail matters. Because if we're all of a sudden get under attack, it's important that the Humvees parked the right way with the wheels angled the right way so our escape can be the fastest it possibly can be. And when you think about it that way, down to like understanding every process drives freedom, right? What you're saying drives creativity. It's so, so freaking powerful. Yeah. And and if if there is if there's one thing that I attribute, it's the is that I mean, when I say focus, that's what I'm talking about, right? When we say we fo- we focused on process, right? We focused on, you know, when we the branding we do. That's just a process. We don't, we don't, we're not creating our branding initiatives as we go, right? It is just a process that we're executing. And, and I, I am, um, 
yeah, you guys are speaking my language. I like this. I, love it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do feel it's amazing when you get, this is the power of your vibe attracts your tribe. Yeah. When you get around people that have the same vibe and the same belief system, you just immediately connect. Cause I feel like I I've known you. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. like, I'm meeting you for the first time. I was like, Oh yeah, I, I know this guy. This is, I know what he believes in, but uh, let me ask you, what's been the biggest adversity, right? Because you've built an incredible organization what has been the biggest challenge for you on the journey? Um, uh, patience, you know, uh, I, 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 um, I, I generally believe that we're going too slow. Like in my soul, I believe we're going too slow and that's a problem. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, if I could just be a little more patient, I think I could enjoy this a lot more mm. and I want to enjoy it more, frankly. Right. So I'm, my partner and I are always on to the next thing, the net, what's, what's the next thing we have to work on. And, and so, you know, I wish I could just be a little bit more patient and, you know, the flip side of that coin is, is maybe if I was more patient, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today, you know? So yep. it's like this, this double edged sword kind yeah. of thing, but the, um, that's kind of a, a, a lame struggle. I'm trying to think, pro, you know, another struggle that we face is uh, expectation. People's expectation coming in is, is in having to em- reset Employees' that. expectation or consumers? Franchise owner. Oh, franchise owner. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because yeah, you're that's, dealing, that's, that's a unique thing in and of itself. So you have all these independent business owners, right? Yeah. Even though it's a franchisee, right? So you have all these independent, so you have to, inspire them, give them processes. How much freedom do they have? Not much. You know, okay. I mean, any, any legitimate franchise that tells you the franchise owner has a lot of freedom. I mean, that's not a legitimate franchise, <laughs> I, you know, so uh, yeah, it, a franchise is meant to be a, a mousetrap, a mechanism that you execute and, and, and signing up for a franchise, you got to know that. But you know, this, this book right here is uh, grind is, is about, I've watched hundreds of people open the same business and there's there's attributes that that the successful owner operators have and there's attributes that the non-successful owner operators have and that's really this what's in this book is because they're all they're all doing the same thing they're all open in the same business and i'll tell you what i wish i would have taken notes i we used to have i don't do it anymore but we used to have a 45 day call with franchise owners and i guarantee you i could i could on that 45 day call i could have predicted success or or failure wow and it was it was all about attitude it was all about enthusiasm it was all about you know there's this you can you know when somebody has got it or when they don't and and i don't know if, if we can figure that piece out, be able to program people <laughs> properly so that they, they, so they stay in the game. It's coming. It's called, it's called they, robots and AI, man. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> and we're all going to be absolute. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so, so to me, is it just uh, energy though? Is it just like when you're getting on with the franchise owner, is it the success? Is it the energy and passion that they're showing? Or are there other attributes that you see in that? I think faith. Mm. belief yeah. faith in themselves right faith like they believe that they are going to succeed yeah there you're not like there's never been any doubt in my mind that my business partner are going to make this thing successful mm. and we're going to grow it like crazy and i've never doubted that not one time and and you, you if you don't have that if you start to lose that faith it's it's a it's a real problem for the business you, you know you can sense it and it's really hard to bring back you know you don't see it come back very often yeah wouldn't you do you think it's like because for me personally wouldn't you think it's like resilience it's like it's you do doubt like i'm sure you've had nights of doubt like extreme doubt but i'm i'm not speaking for you but but you've been resilient right you you're able to get up the next day and not focus on that doubt and put that where it belongs back in that box because you have a vision that's driving you. Cause I just think of all the entrepreneurs listening to this, thinking to themselves, no, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can do it. That's normal. Like, you know, it's normal to doubt whether or not you can succeed. The difference maker is the people who go in face of their doubt. That's real courage, right? Real yeah, courage yeah. is showing up in the face of your fear like it, I mean, just to show up every day, if you have no fear, that's not courage. That's just 
doing something. <laughs> Courage is showing up in the face of your fear, right? So I don't know if you if yeah. you agree with that or not, but yeah, the, I mean, I think resilience is a component of faith, maybe. And and you know, we talk about faith all the time, and it's not a religious term to us. It, you know, faith is is confidence. It's 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 faith in yourself, and and uh, and we are you know we believe in it. That, that you have to have it. And, yeah, I think like, in, you know, resilience is also, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been, I've been brought down to my knees many times, right? I mean, <laughs> hardcore, <laughs> doubled over, sucking wind, can't breathe, you know, you know, uh, and, but it, you know what? I'm still going to get up. I'm going to still keep going. Yeah, um, you know, exactly. it's, it's, it's a, it's a level of commitment that did you guys, did you guys uh, hear the Elon uh, Musk quote on his, um, uh, what's that called? Oh, uh, Clubhouse. Yes. Yeah, you share you that the, quote? Oh man, share this. Do you remember it? Because it's amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Share the yeah. quote. It's and unbelievable. They asked him uh, what words of encouragement he has for for people who want to be entrepreneurs, and he said, "If you need words of encouragement, don't become an entrepreneur." You're not an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I'm greatest. Sure I oh, it, oh I loved it too. I saw that's it. And I was real. like, "That's so great. That is yeah. so freaking fantastic." Yeah, you've got to have you've got to have faith in a vision that that brings you getting back up every single time. Like that's yeah, going to be the difference. You know, maker. The, the only the only correlation. I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have kids, but like, you know, if your kid was in trouble, you'd get up and you'd go, you would do whatever it took to, to help that, mm. you know, and that's, yeah, you that's, don't need words of inspiration to go, to go do that. <laughs> that's what you need in your business. And, right. I, and it, I know that sounds pretty dramatic, but to me, that's the level of commitment, uh, the level of resilience you show up, you yep. just never stop showing up. What is it that Tony Robbins teaches? He says, most people make the excuse <clears throat> they don't have the resources, but really what they aren't is they're not resourceful. Good entrepreneurs are resourceful. They don't need resources. They become resourceful. And that, you know, the kids analogy is a perfect example because you will instantaneously become resourceful. If your kid's in trouble, you will find a way to help your kid. Even if you don't have the tools, the means, whatever it is, you'll do whatever it takes. I, I love that, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, we got to ask you because I, I mean, I'm loving this interview. I feel like I could go on for another hour. We're barely scratching the surface. You're unbelievable, man. So really appreciate you coming on the show. Want to ask you, you know, we ask everybody who comes on, what are the routines that you implement in your life that have gotten to where you're at today? Like, as you look back, what are the routines that you do every day to drive success? I get up friggin' early. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm done. I'm done with my day by seven 30 in the morning, you know? And, and I, I mean, what I mean by that is, is I've taken care of the important things and I know what the rest of my day looks like by seven 30. And so by seven 30, I'm just going to execute the rest of the day. And, and, uh, but it's that five to seven 30 window where I get everything done, everything organized and ready for, mm. You know, I, I, I'm struggling right now because I, I got a, got a one-year-old and a, and a, and a four-year-old <laughs> and they're messing with my program, you know? Uh, but you know, it, to me, that's, that is, um, I would say that's my routine. And you know, there, there are other things. I, I am a horrible communicator when it comes to like email and texting and social media and so on, because I don't let that, that stuff get in my way. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, what I tell people is, is, you know, when somebody says to me, yeah, but I sent you an email, I'm like, yeah, but that, that's a horrible, I mean, that doesn't count. If, if you need to communicate with me, don't just send me an email. If you need something from me, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to get with me. Right. And that, you know, I don't know how you do it. It's, you know, through my assistant, through my business partner, call me directly. I don't know. But so, so I think the other thing that, um, I, I, I really limit the amount of, distraction through all the different medias. Mm. And, and what that allows me to do is spend time on what's actually important. And so you guys send me an email tomorrow and you say, Hey, listen, this is a really cool interview. We'd love to have you quote an article I'm writing. Well, if I accept that email, right. And I look down and I read that email, all of a sudden you've become a priority on my to-do list, even though 10 minutes ago, you weren't a priority on my to-do list. And so, so that's another, and, and I think, um, to me, that's a, that's huge because you, you you need to decide what's most important for you to be doing today, not all of this other stuff interacting with you. Yeah. One question, uh, Michael, that we ask everyone who comes on the show, what's something you would go back and tell your younger self? 
don't marry my first wife. <laughs> oh, is that? <laughs> and thank you for being on the show, Mike. <laughs> That's the words of wisdom, baby. That's real. That's raw. That's real. Don't uh, no, I mean, I, oh. you know, in, in, in seriousness, uh, you know, I would say um, that the magic word focus, mm. you know, that just, I, and, and we get distracted, you know, we do. And, and I just wish we wouldn't. And, and it gets in the way every time we, we, you know, we're off in the weeds on stuff. So stay focused, stay on it. And then the other thing is I would probably say to my younger self, it's going to work out, man. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the ride a little bit more. Mm, I love that. All right, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before we close out, obviously people can get your book on Amazon, right? So that's grind the no or the a no BS approach to take your business from concept to cash flow. I don't know why we're sensing ourselves. It's not like we've never. <laughs> hey, we're a PG-13 we're show. We're a PG-13 show. Oh, I swore earlier. Are you guys going to be able yeah. to edit that? No, no we're fine. It's, it's going to be, it's going to tank us, dude. Let people know how they can uh, <laughs> connect with you then before we close out here. Um, you know, I mean, the, the social medias are good. Uh, I, I don't personally engage them, but uh, you know, I have, I have people that do and, 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 you know, I, I try to, I'm trying to systematize that as much as I can. So I can interact with people. Um, but I did put my cell phone in the book, right? If awesome. you, if you want to, if you want to get with me, call me. Hmm. Right. I and love that, that. To, to me, that's, and I, and I get phone calls. I don't get a ton you know, which is, uh, but they're always respectful. They're always short. You know, we have a quick conversation. And then if we find there's something there more that we can talk about, we, we set up a time. That's awesome. How can we get, uh, how can we petition to get Big B in Pennsylvania here? We're outside of Philadelphia. When are you coming to, I saw you have one in New Jersey. So I need a yeah, petition to, to get, to get you guys over here in Pennsylvania. I'm tired of this Starbucks stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what activity we have in Pennsylvania right now. Um, but I, you know, we're, 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 Pretty heavy in Cleveland right now, awesome. and so so we're coming we're coming in that direction. I yeah, think we I saw have you're moving out. Stores, Twelve stores in our contract there. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Well, any entrepreneurs listening to this, if you're interested in the franchise model, where, where where can they go to learn about your franchisees? Bigby.com okay. forward slash franchising. Yeah. Nice. That's, awesome. I mean, it's brand new. It's like two weeks old. We just did it. It's cool. That's awesome. That's man. awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here again, Michael. Thank you for listening to dive deeper into this episode. Get all of the links there. You can get the links to Michael's book. You can get the links to uh, finding out how to become a franchisee. You can head on over to statepaidpodcast.com for those show notes. While there, you can also find the video for this episode. If you're interested in supporting the show, there's only two ways we ask you to do that. The first is to head on over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us, leave a review along with a comment to let us know how we're doing. And the best way is to share this podcast with a friend. If you want to get hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com. You can also find us on Instagram. We are at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Acre. What an incredible episode. And go back and listen to this episode again. There's so many valuable golden nuggets in there. Here's your action item for this episode, right? So you hear Michael talk about the word focus and how it's driven everything. So how can you be more focused? Do you have all all of the processes mapped out in your organization, right? You're the doer, but then you have to document what you're doing. You have to document what you're doing so then you can delegate it, right? So you want to do, document, delegate. So take some time this week, pick just one of your processes. You got to take action. So take, pick one and document it out so you can start processing out your business. Remember, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in every single industry Josh and I have worked in is top producers take action. Take action on that today. <laughs> <laughs>